The attempt to explain the state of mind of an admitted killer hinges on a controversial question. Did his autism leave him unable to tell right from wrong? To that then question who went terrifies on rampage, Alex will be trapped the building and even themselves. All day long, the best house Jake any Davison violence had occurred. shot and killed uh, his 51-year-old mother. Now maybe mother we'll get a better him. picture as to what his mindset so I should start by saying that this video has some very heavy themes in it, including violence, eugenics, and hate crimes. If you're not in the right headspace for that, then this might not be the right video for you. So outside of that, preamble, preamble, let's just dive in. I made this video as a response to the news Jacob Chansley. Chansley? Nah. AKA QAnon Shaman is having his defense lawyer suggest the reason himself and many others stormed the Capitol whilst being extremely vulnerable to Trump's white supremacist rhetoric is because they are autistic. Well, that's not the language defense lawyer Albert Watkins uses, but you get the idea. Expanding on this, other times I see autism be used as an attempted defense or explanation of violent antisocial behavior is often in mass shootings, particularly school shootings. This happened with Columbine, Sandy Hook, Aurora, Elliot Roger, and many others. Unfortunately, whilst writing this video, there was a terror attack in the form of a mass shooting in Britain, and sure enough, it brought about with it the same tired dialogue surrounding the perpetrator's supposed autism and how key a factor this was in his horrific acts. Other attempted terrorist attacks in the UK have also inevitably led to questions around autism and violence, and there is also a famous case in Toronto where a man drove a van into a group of pedestrians in 2018, which killed 10 and injured 16, and his legal defence attempted to argue he wasn't criminally responsible because he was autistic. After experiencing a shared trauma, particularly one that gets a lot of sensationalist press and repeats itself in news cycles like mass shootings do, I think it's natural to try and search for explanations why someone would turn to violence on such an extreme scale. And trying to pinpoint a specific disorder or condition as like the violent gene or the condition that creates mass shooters is a way of trying to solve these problems. A whole populace pathologizing a condition like autistic people or Targaryens in Game of Thrones. They say every time an autistic is born, the gods toss a coin and the world holds its breath. Like all autistic people are just going to simply become the Joker. Or I guess Two-Face if we're going for the coin analogy. Autism gets framed as something used to excuse harmful behaviour on a big destructive scale like terrorism, but also in smaller interpersonal interactions too. It's that whole stereotype of autistic people have no filter and don't understand social cues and expectations so they think they can say whatever they want with no consequences even if it's really hurtful or bigoted. My father used to say that a woman is like an egg salad sandwich on a warm Texas day. <laughs> What? <laughs> Full of eggs and only appealing for a short time. You guys sucked ass. Uh, I'm sorry, and you are? I'm Sugar Mata, and I self-diagnose Asperger's so I can pretty much say whatever I want. Sorry, I have a syndrome. I don't really have a filter. I don't pick up on social cues. You mean you're rude? Yeah, but now it's a disease I can take medication for. We have pills for rudeness? I know. And they can't figure out the Middle East, go figure. So, this lawyer's got attitude, and that attitude? Autism. It's heavily linked to the idea autistic people are incapable of feeling empathy, so don't care if they hurt others. And if we're really going to deconstruct this perspective, you have to ask, is there any validity to it? Does being autistic make you more likely to perpetuate violence? And does being autistic make it more likely that you're not going to understand the consequences of your actions or other people's feelings? In a word, no. Fuck no. A world of no. A, a universe, universe of no. So first of all, it's worth stating that the autistic community pushed back really hard on this narrative, and honestly with good reason. Whether it's the implication black men are inherently more violent, or the idea that LGBTQ plus people are more likely to be predators just because of their sexuality or gender, you just have to look at the history of other marginalised groups when it comes to painting them as inherently more dangerous to the public, to see why implying all autistic people are in danger of becoming mass shooters or terrorists is harmful and dangerous. Autistic people are much more likely to be on the receiving end of abuse in healthcare, social care and education. Disability in general accounts for a shocking amount of police brutality statistics. 
As for the abuse in healthcare, we just have to look at the fact that a residential facility in Massachusetts is allowed to use electric shock therapy as part of a behaviour plan for disabled and autistic children at the time of making this video. Not to mention, although it's a good thing it's rarely taken seriously when defence lawyers attempt to use someone's autism as an excuse for committing harm to neurotypical people, it's still notable it is taken seriously when neurotypical people who have hurt or even killed autistic people in their care have used their victim's autism as a reason for murdering them. I'm not saying we should start to excuse autistic people for disgusting behaviour because they're autistic. I'm saying we should be condemning the line of thinking that absolves these people who have murdered their children so they are also held accountable. Don't make me tap the sign. That's just by the wider structures of society. Interpersonally, autistic people are also much more likely to be bullied and abused. In fact, in the UK there's this thing called mate crime, which is when an assumed neurotypical person manipulates or takes advantage of a vulnerable person with the intention to exploit them in some way, usually financially, but often emotionally and physically too. Trigger warning here for violence, torture and murder. Skip to this time code if you don't want to hear it. Take for example the case of Philip Nicholson, an autistic man who was manipulated into following people he thought were his friend's home who wound up torturing him to try and financially exploit him. They ended up killing him and supposedly some of his last words before they murdered him was, I just wanted to be friends. It should haunt all of us because it is horrifically indicative of the kind of treatment a lot of autistic people expect to face. Maybe not taken to that extreme, but certainly the elements that led to his eventual murder. It's also interesting how often autism is mentioned when an autistic person is the perpetuator of violence, but never when autistic people are the targets of mass violence, especially as more often than not, when autistic people are the targets of that kind of violence, it's linked to eugenics. An example of this is the mass murder in Japan in 2016, one of Japan's worst mass killings in decades. A man broke into a care home he used to work in and murdered 19 people with a knife, and injured another 26. The man who committed this crime had recently been hospitalised after attempting to send a letter to a house representative calling for the euthanasia of disabled people before going on to commit this atrocity. It was noted even at the time by disability activists that this didn't get nearly the same amount of press other acts of mass violence get. Not to mention how many people don't know disabled people were some of the first targeted by the Nazis. If they weren't going through conversion therapy to be made into quote unquote productive citizens, then they were being sent to specialist children's wards to be murdered several years before Nazis devised a final solution for Europe's Jews. And I truly believe we can see an elaboration of this kind of eugenicist thinking in how disabled and vulnerable autistic people were treated during the pandemic too. We can see how doctors and medical professionals acted like learning or intellectually disabled people were expendable or a waste of life who would be better off dead. I find the most frustrating thing about how these acts tend to be framed is the way it depicts ideal kinds of victims and honestly ideal perpetrators too. Always painting autistic people as the perpetrators of violence instead of accurately depicting them as the victims of it erases our struggles and also acts as a good cover for why people are violent without having to think too critically. Of course he's violent, he's autistic. It's much easier than having to look at the reasons why someone would choose to do something like that from an environmental perspective. And same when discussing the victimisation of autistic people. If they were framed accurately as the victims of violence in a way that matches statistics, you'd have to start asking serious questions around the patterns within society that leads to the mistreatment of so many autistic people. So yeah, autistic people, mostly on the receiving end of a gross amount of injustice and violence, definitely not the perpetrators of it. And to this you might say, right, well just because autistic people are overwhelmingly the victims of violence doesn't mean they're not capable of perpetuating it at all. But correlation does not equal causation. By that I mean, just because a mass shooter is autistic doesn't mean they're a mass shooter because they're autistic. There was recently an investigation undertaken by an independent reviewer looking into terrorism in the UK. Why it happens, how it happens, what are the warning signals you have to look for, and who is most likely to fall for the kind of ideologies that lead to such destructive behaviour. There was even a whole segment on autistic people in particular, and whether or not they are more likely to commit acts of violence because of their autism. So there's a lot of things in this report that I don't think is phrased too well. It reads like someone whose experience of autism is purely theoretical. Consider the offence of possession of material likely to be useful to a terrorist. 
Academics use the word remoteness to draw attention to the fact that having possession of something does not necessarily mean you're going to do something with it. What about autistic people who simply develop what is called a special interest in this sort of material? Humanoid autisticus, known simply as an autistic, belonging to the species given the umbrella term the neurodivergent, uses what is known as a special interest to stun neurotypicals by fixating on things occasionally deemed by wider society as dangerous or antisocial. The autistic, aware of wider society's stigmas, laughs, a loud shrill laugh, often with no sensory awareness of their own volume. Knowing these special interests actually typically span subjects, ranging from rock collecting to memorizing argue quotes and collecting memorabilia from TV shows and films, neurotypicals die confused that the neurodivergent inherit the earth. But outside of the weird way that document is phrased, it has an entire segment on whether or not being autistic impacts a person's vulnerability to internalizing dangerous rhetoric, and basically it finds no. We need to have me to elaborate, it mentions the hesitancy around talking about a potential link because of the stigma autistic people could face, but based on this review, the red flags don't come from autism, but other extenuating circumstances. How is their home life? Are they loved? Are they safe? Are they autistic? Or are there other conditions at play too? Reading this document, it presses the urgency to address violent ideologies which include the narratives we've heard previously in the news, Islamic extremism, obvious white supremacist groups, etc. But the other most concurrent factor is nihilism, those juicy red and black pills the incels can't get enough of. If there is an ideological component, and I think there may well be one, it is a nihilism which seeks the end of days. It has something akin to the revolution of the unhappy or the beta uprising carried out by incels or involuntary celibates. I think this proves that it doesn't matter what your neurotype is. If you're in a shit place in your life, these ideologies are much more likely to get a hold on you, as opposed to things that inspire optimism and healthy community. And the thing about being autistic is it affects how people treat you, which can then affect how you see yourself. So no, being autistic doesn't make you more likely to cause harm, being treated badly because you're autistic might raise those odds. If we remove autism completely from the equation, what other identifiers are we left with? This honestly depends on the crime, but there are a couple of factors that tie a lot of these things together, the most obvious being that overwhelmingly, the perpetrators of these attacks have been men. 98% of mass shooters are men, and according to research undergone in 2018-2019, to 88% of people arrested on terrorism related charges are men. Now, these statistics should be taken with a pinch of salt, especially since how you define terrorism changes all the time and can be hinged on things like, you know, melanin. But this gives us a rough idea. So let's start there. Why is it overwhelmingly men that do things like this? I've never seen people a, in so much fear, and B, so sick and tired of being afraid. So something's going to happen. But I think we're in the middle of kind of white male power over making a last stand. I think this is a last stand. So like their disillusion comes from the failures, I would say, of neoliberalism. The world is going to change, but people who feel like power is finite are going to go down fighting. You know, I understand nationalism as yeah. a response to globalization. Yeah. Telling people like two decades, you know, two generations ago, oh yeah, well, there's this thing called England, go and die for it, will you? Oh, there's no, there's no England now, there's yeah. no England Doesn't now. Matter. Yeah. If you can weaponize vulnerability, fear and uncertainty, get people really divided and rattled, and then deliver on a golden platter an enemy that they can blame for their pain, mm. you can, you can do anything. I think the past decade has provided a lot of evidence that backs up Brene Brown's claim, that we are on the precipice of world-shifting changes and people are frightened, so many are clinging to their current social standing, the place they've held throughout all recent history. It's not that autistic people are more inclined towards bigoted rhetoric, they are equally as drawn to it as neurotypical people. Autistic men are no different to neurotypical men in this way, it's just another layer to complicated power dynamics. 
these autistic men will know oppression because they're autistic. This oppression will cause a lot of anger and frustration. They can't punch up at the people making their lives miserable. So where's left for them to go? Women. Immigrants. Teenage girls. Their mother in the Plymouth Shooters case. I'm reminded of how Dylan Roof pushed back so hard on being autistic because he thought autistic people were all nerds and losers and wanted to be labelled a sociopath instead. Being autistic would fly in the face of all the Nazi bullshit he'd internalised. If he had to concede he was autistic, we all know what Nazis think is the best port of call for autistic people. Roof wanted to distance himself from autism because he wanted to be as close to hegemonic power as possible. Whiteness. Patriarchy. Instead of asking why perpetrators are autistic, it's strange to me that something like gender isn't brought up more when it's a much more common correlation. I should have done more to emphasize here that whiteness is also an overwhelming correlation when looking at statistics, particularly for mass shooters, two-thirds of mass shooters are white. Race is also a huge factor in many of these incidents and it is important to acknowledge that, given my points about the violence often involved in defending established power dynamics. But again, looking at it through the perspective of gender suddenly eliminates autism as a potential cause, and it means you would have to look at lots more data involving men and terrorism. And even though clearly most men aren't terrorists, most terrorists are men. So it would invite deeper critical thinking about why that pattern exists, and what it is about our current society that seems to be reinforcing this particular correlation. And something tells me, these questions aren't wanted by the people who have the power to meaningfully change the environment these trends are created in. As stated in The Violence Project, How to Stop a Mass Shooting Epidemic, sociologist Michael Kimmel argues that the modern push towards greater gender and racial equality in the United States, spearheaded by the Black Lives Matter and Me Too social movements, which has intentionally challenged traditional white male privilege and power, has left some men feeling bewildered and tenaciously clinging to an anachronistic ideology of masculinity. Raised to expect unparalleled social and economic privilege, white men are suffering today from what Kimmel calls aggrieved entitlement, a sense that those benefits that they believed were their due have been snatched away from them. Kimmel suggests that the relationship between violence and masculinity is particularly acute among the group he labels angry white men, because they can no longer do gender in the traditional ways. A series of humbling cultural and economic shifts has left some of the long-standing winners in American society feeling humiliated and victimised, unsure of exactly where they fit in, longing to win again. White supremacy, patriarchy, nationalism and eugenics are external power constructs our current world is built on, and will inspire deadly pushback and violence in people's attempts to defend it. After all this, I think it's really important to ask why it is repeated in the media that there is a link between autism and violence when it's not even true. Like, where did this narrative even come from? There's a long history of society explaining away the undesirable behaviour of the world's weirdos by diagnosing them with conditions that dates back to ancient Egypt, from female hysteria being used as a blanket diagnosis for literally anything relating to people who menstruate, to this list of reasons for admission to a lunatic asylum in the 19th century. Uh, this list is incredibly comprehensive. We can imagine from this list the identity of whoever fell victim to these symptoms seems to be a huge factor in whether or not they were institutionalised, and there are lots of things on this list that definitely appear to speak to some kind of neurodivergence too. I mention this because what is defined as antisocial isn't apparent signs of madness, but breaks with societally enforced morality. Some of these people clearly were struggling with stuff, but a lot of it reads quite arbitrarily, and seemingly only exists to police the behaviour of the masses by punishing things labelled deviant according to the norms of the time, which is all a roundabout way of saying autism and autistic behaviour is frequently linked with deviance and therefore a lack of morality. Witnessing someone break with the established morality of the times, even if you're not on the receiving end or participating in it, can feel like an act of violence. It breaks us from what we're told is the right way to live our lives, it's jarring, and it's extremely easy to write people off who do engage with these behaviours as bad or evil, and yourself as good. 
Not only this, but you can imagine this would serve a purpose. Autistic people are often likely to call out injustice and inequality. So, how do you handle people who engage in behaviour that may frequently break with current ideas on morality and could potentially influence other people to do the same that threaten the established order? Institutionalise them, whilst also in the modern day attributing horrifying violence that gets a lot of press attention to this specific condition too. It's genius, because it means people in power could then use this condition as a perceived flaw that undermines their political rivals, or not just to explain away this particular violent act, but any act that could threaten how things currently are. Even when autism could only be diagnosed in children as childhood schizophrenia, autistic people were being unfairly framed as defective and even frightening. And that's why it's so awful when in the modern day, you see how people who commit these acts of violence get dissected so much in the press and it starts to impact how all autistic people are treated. For example, when a Facebook group called Families Against Autistic Shooters was created in light of a mass shooter killing nine people in Oregon. Comments left in the group included remarks on the so-called soulless dead eyes of autistic children and calling them calculating killing machines with no regard for human life. What do all shooters over the last few years have in common? A lack of empathy and compassion due to autism. The terrorists and school shooter myths have just added to pre-existed fears and suspicion historically surrounding autistic people, and at a certain point it's not just the act of violence that gets portrayed as frightening or weird, but everything about them as people, which will include their autistic traits, which people who would never even dream of hurting another person will also have and face stigma for. When you consider Asperger's, originates from a scientist who is trying to either convert autistic people out of their autistic traits to make them better workers, or simply kill them, we can see how this perception of autism as dangerous, deviant or undesirable has been reinforced again and again within society throughout history. The way autism is diagnosed in children tends to follow a deficit model, meaning a child's development is marked by all the stages they're perceived to be falling behind on or not hitting. From the second autism is considered, it's framed as something lacking, something wrong, something missing compared to neurotypical children. All this to say, autistic people have been observed, diagnosed, pathologised and mistreated, often by neurotypicals who don't understand us and don't understand the way our brains work. We're forced to work in environments that work against our sensory needs, and neurotypicals put us in situations where we're at a much greater risk of having meltdowns than write all about us through the deficit model, robbing us of the opportunity to vocalise our own perspectives and insight. Trying to survive in an environment that doesn't accommodate your sensory needs is traumatic. You can't switch it off, it doesn't go away. This is why most, if not all, autistic people are traumatised in some way. In reading more research about the links between autism, trauma and violence, what becomes apparent again is autism is not the factor that increases the likelihood of perpetuating violence, despite overwhelmingly being the victims of it, as proven by this study. 45 adults with ASC and 42 adults without ASC completed questionnaires regarding violence victimization and perpetration, emotion regulation, and socio-communicative competence. Participants with ASC reported experiencing, as children, more overall victimization, specifically more property crime, maltreatment, teasing, emotional bullying, and sexual assault by peers, compared to participants without ASC. Participants with ASC also reported experiencing more teasing, emotional bullying in adulthood and greater sexual contact victimization. No significant differences were found between groups on perpetration. Low rates were found for both severe and more minor occurrences of violence perpetration. These results map onto the existing reviews finding low rates of perpetration in individuals with ASC and no clear association with violent crime. Continuing the reasons the link between autistic people as perpetuators of violence has been overstated, there's also the fact that currently the disabled and the mentally ill are painted as a waste of resources from the word go, because in the world where people are taught they should be taking personal responsibility, only looking after themselves, and that society doesn't exist, the existence of a marginalised group who cannot help but be dependent on others will always be painted negatively, because it flies in the face of an ideology that's meant to cement the supposedly ordained superiority of capitalism. So like their disillusion comes from the failures I would say of neoliberalism. It's worth bringing in the society autistic people work in, 
because the pressure to mask and produce can lead to meltdowns. In fact, I was very lucky to contribute to a video by Pundiful talking about this specific issue. I highly recommend you watch that for more information. But discussing meltdowns specifically in relation to violence, some meltdowns can be violent. They're frequently confused for tantrums in children, and in adults, people just make the shallow observation that you're unhinged. To which I say, how dare you make observations about me that are completely true. But meltdowns are not things autistic people can control. It's your brain firing off in absolute panic mode. Now the difficulty is, if you don't know what's happening, it can be misconstrued. You see it in videos that go viral. Someone has a violent meltdown when they're not coping, and it leads to mass shaming. Because we don't live in a world that focuses on de-escalation, what we get instead are narratives that autistic people are scary, uncontrollable, violent monsters who can't be reasoned with because they don't think like everyone else. Essentially, it's another way we get dehumanised. One last quick note on this, this is just a theory from me, so take this with a massive pinch of salt. This line of questioning reminded me of a great talk with Angela Davis that I will link in the description all about disability and madness in relation to prison abolition and the current state of care as an industry. And again, this is just my theory, crackpot leftist alert, feel free to disregard it, but I truly believe it benefits the state to portray autistic people as scary violent people who aren't capable of controlling their actions because it lends itself to a narrative where neurotypical people don't feel safe. So support the state stepping in and exerting control over neurodivergent people in the name of safety. The average citizen is then much more likely to trust governments who implement carceral legislation to deal with autistics, which limits autistic people's choices to either assimilate as best you can or don't assimilate potentially leaving you more vulnerable to things like institutionalisation and or prison. Leaving the government to manage your care, which we see repeatedly leads autistic people into environments and situations that contribute to early deaths. They're no longer a drain on resources, but all this is just a theory. A film theory. So that's just a few reasons why autism may be perceived to be linked to violence in some way even though it's not true. But the last point to drive this home is autistic people are not implicitly driven to violence because we are completely capable of understanding why it's wrong to hurt someone. I can't believe this needs stating in 2021, but yes, autistic people are completely capable of empathy. People who have attempted to use autism as a defence plea in the same way people plea insanity or diminished responsibility, particularly in cases relating to acts of violence like terrorism and mass shootings, have typically had their cases rejected or denied because autism does not mean autistic people are incapable of compassion, or understanding other people's pain, or only acting reactively to their own pain. There's this thing called theory of mind, and instead of explaining it myself, because I am just a humble bimbo, I'm just going to use this clip from the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, which gives a decent summary. Because I am nothing if not reasonable and scienceable, and Richard Dawkins would agree. There's no controversy around Richard Dawkins, right? That's because a three-year-old doesn't do what scientists call attributing mental states to other people. She doesn't think that other people have thoughts, desires, beliefs, knowledge. So by six, children have the ability to uh, attribute mental states to others. They have what we call a theory of mind. We're forever making a distinction between what people do and what they think we do. The idea that autistic people lack theory of mind is incredibly pervasive in psychology and healthcare, historically pushed by psychologists such as Borat's cousin, Simon Baron Cohen, who just this year was knighted for his services to autistic people, despite a lot of his research being questionable at best and outright harmful at worst. Even though there appears to be some recognition now that theory of mind as it has historically been defined is harmful, after parroting it for so long, it seems the damage has been done. As this article states, More recently, Baron Cohen has acknowledged that a lack of theory of mind may not be specific to autistic people. For nearly 30 years, other researchers have also tried to correct this inaccurate claim. But the erroneous claim that only autistic people, together with robots and chimpanzees, lack a theory of mind and are therefore biologically set apart from the rest of humanity in lacking the basic machinery, 
echoes throughout psychological literature, practice, and instruction. This narrative that autistic people aren't aware of other people because of poor theory of mind is one that needs to be debunked because it is incredibly dehumanising. It's particularly bad because this isn't a myth that's just regurgitated by people who don't know about autism, but by organisations that purport to support the autistic community, as seen in this recent NHS leaflet to parents attempting to help them understand how to recognise an autistic child. Autistic people, particularly high support needs people who are being cared for by the state, can often end up being spoken about like they're animals or robots without agency. In fact, we've just seen that in this quote. It all ends in the belief that autistic people are not fully human beings. They lack the complexity of neurotypicals and therefore they are not deserving of autonomy. And there's a lot of narratives around autism that fuel this incorrect perception outside of theory of mind. Autistic people are often described as incapable of making and maintaining friendships, untrue, autistic people frequently strive for friendship, and it's neurotypicals that tend to reject these attempts, that we respond incorrectly to certain social cues due to a lack of awareness of ourselves and others, again, untrue, we just tend to have a delayed response because we can take slightly longer to process, and that we lack awareness of other people's feelings. That last part in particular is untrue. There's a theory called the Empathy and Balance Hypothesis, put forward in a research paper by Adam Smith. I'm a little bit wary of it because it still uses Baron Cohen's theory of mind as a baseline for understanding empathy, but I thought it was worth mentioning because in its attempt to build on the admittedly shaky research by Baron Cohen, it does acknowledge something I think is important for people to understand. Any conclusion positing that most people with autism have a general empathy deficit does not seem justified. People with autism may use avoidant patterns of attention to restrict empathetic arousal, and researchers should consider the possibility that an emotional empathy surfeit can mimic an emotional empathy deficit. The concept of an emotional empathy surfeit is consistent with the recurrent theme in the narratives of people with autism and their caregivers. That statement isn't perfect by any means. If you're in the autistic community, you know person first language isn't ideal. But it does hit on something I don't think many people outside the autistic community know. Autistic people are frequently not only empathetic, but empathetic to a point where it's actually painful to process. I know speaking for myself that sometimes when people come to me with their problems, historically I could even fall into toxic positivity, because sitting with the pain of knowing someone close to me is hurting can be too much. I've worked on it and I'm getting better though. So therefore it could be argued that in empathising too much, I give a perceptively unempathetic response. Empath really means you can feel for other people, mm -hmm. and that's not a technical diagnosis. The effect that somebody with no empathy can have on others, right? I have had a lot of people in my life who might be narcissists. Mm -hmm. um, I'm always the one that's trying to help them. So I'm sorry for, you know, not to apologize, because I've already apologized a million bajillion times, but I am sorry. Um, that I made it a horror movie. The tendency to focus on empathy through theory of mind is it tends to be defined as a trait instead of a skill. Self-proclaimed empaths never seem to acknowledge how empathy is a skill that's teachable. In discussing this skill like it's an aspirational identifier for a whole personality, it becomes about who naturally possesses this specific skill, which infers moral superiority. By shifting the focus onto you, they can make it seem as if you're in the wrong when you aren't. In reality, you simply have a lot of compassion and care for the world around you, which definitely isn't anything to apologize for. Not to apologize, because I've already apologized a million bajillion times, but I learned I'm an empath, right? More power to you. And it's always an extremely black and white thing, and you tend to find empath is often positioned as the opposite of someone with a certain condition. For example, someone socio or psychopathic, or with borderline or narcissistic personality or bipolar disorder. Which in media and online discussions is heavily demonised and always framed as bad. These conditions are positioned as a form of the good or bad dichotomy, the empath naturally being good, and the other listed conditions tending to stand in for bad. In our current self-help culture, it's notable how many videos are quick to reassure people that may have been victimised by someone practising toxic behaviour that they were hurt by what was probably a narcissist. Sometimes there's a delineation between narcissistic behaviour and someone with narcissistic personality disorder, but often they are talked about like it's the same thing. 
Even online psychiatrists unfortunately bandy the term narcissist or narcissistic personality disorder around for clickbait, which I personally think is quite irresponsible because narcissistic personality disorder requires very specific diagnostic criteria to be met and according to respected people in the field of psychology, having narcissistic personality disorder is actually quite rare. But the way it gets thrown around online, you'd think every other person had it. And what the researchers ended up finding out was that the cue on the face that was consistently associated with grandiose narcissism was eyebrows. Now the researchers determined that this finding actually was much more statistically strong when they used images of women. So think of all the ways that you use your eyebrows in any given day. Questioning, doubting, scowling, startled. But maybe those distinctive eyebrows are two little red flags that are sitting above their eyes saying, Maybe you should have paid attention sooner. So look alive, pay attention to those eyebrows. Again, these findings are more pronounced in women than men, but it's always such a pleasure to bring some of this new science to you. I'm on top of it. I found this fascinating. I read the study a couple of times. I'm like, really? The over-pathologizing of certain behaviors is leading to a lot of unfair stigma towards conditions which are already heavily stigmatized in the first place. A microcosm of this is things like the autistic terrorist myths, or anyone with narcissistic personality disorder is naturally an abuser myth. They lead people to be placed into a good or bad dichotomy based entirely on a diagnosis that may not even be correct, and even if it is, in no way begins to touch the complexity of an entire human being and their unique experiences and why they may go on to perpetuate harm or violence. Because for every person who has these conditions that does do something horrible, there will be many others of the same conditions that don't. I think instead of holding up empathy as some sort of innate virtue bestowed on some and not others, the focus should always be retained on it as a behaviour, that some people grasp more quickly than others, but it can always be taught, even with neurodivergences where incorrectly taught make empathy impossible. Experimental evidence shows that narcissistic individuals experience regular levels of empathy when being instructed to put themselves into the perspective of a suffering person. Similarly, psychopathic individuals, viewed as similar yet more severely disordered, can indeed experience empathy. Psychopathic individuals show similar brain activation as controls and the interior insula and anterior cingulate cortex, but only deliberately, not spontaneously. This confirms the notion of reduced propensity for empathic reactions, not reduced capacity in terms of general inability to share others' effect in psychopathic individuals. One of the most interesting things from this article is how it concludes, with the idea that going forward, instead of describing the phenomena as empathy, we instead describe it as affect sharing. An argument for restraining the term empathy to affect sharing, as is being done in a large portion of the current literature, is that it makes the usage of the term unmistakable and distinctive. The umbrella usage, in contrast, requires specification as to which component is actually referred to in order to avoid misunderstanding. Now, I should state, this article also heavily relies on theory of mind as a concept, but at least there's some recognition that it's far more complex than its original definition, and only one potential part of a far more overreaching neurological experience when it comes to attempting to experience the feelings of others. Reading about all this, it becomes extremely apparent that people have very different ideas around empathy, how it's performed and how it's received. People have different understandings of empathy depending on the theory they read into. A lot of these studies come from the history of neurotypical people studying neurodivergent people to understand their differences. As Donna Williams says, Right from the start, from the time someone came up with the word autism, the condition has been judged from the outside by its appearances and not from the inside according to how it is experienced. Neurodivergence has always been studied by neurotypicals through a deficit model, as previously discussed the markers of which are about what a neurodivergent person is not able to do compared to a neurotypical. It's about all the markers that we're not hitting, the ways in which we lack, and perceived deficits in social interactions have always been part of that. But psychologist Dr. Damian Milton pushes back on this, devising something he calls the double empathy theory. For a long time, research has shown that autistic people can have trouble figuring out what non-autistic people are thinking and feeling and this can make it difficult for them to make friends or to fit in. But recently, studies have shown that the problem goes both ways. People who are not autistic also have trouble figuring out what autistic people are thinking and feeling. It is not just autistic people who struggle. A theory that helps to describe what happens when autistic and non-autistic people struggle to understand each other is called the double empathy problem. 
Empathy is defined as the ability to understand or be aware of the feelings, thoughts, and experiences of others. According to the double empathy problem, empathy is a two-way process that depends a lot on our ways of doing things and our expectations from previous social experiences, which can be very different for autistic and non-autistic people. A lot of people approach the concept of empathy and being an empath as humble bragged into meme-worthy status by Shane Dawson. So I've learned I'm an empath, right? Like an innate trait, like any label, it's a fixed state of being. The difficulty with this is it places all onus on behaviour entirely down to personal psychological chemistry that someone is either born with or not. It encourages individualistic thinking in the way that it can be used as a reason to not critique things from a more systemic point of view. It doesn't invite curiosity into how someone is nurtured if we just excuse bad behaviour away by putting it entirely onto nature. Especially since the science repeatedly points out that nurture is the most important factor in the perpetuation of violence. And the thing about people who go on to commit these crimes is, if we look at the studies, they may have struggled with empathy or affect sharing, but that doesn't mean that they weren't capable of it, either psychologically or as a behaviour. People are very quick to surmise that it's autism that is the cause of people's difficulty with affect sharing, despite the fact that many of these people have a third party condition that are often trapped in difficult home circumstances. It's important to note that because autism is often dragged up first whenever this topic is mentioned, it leads people to be misdiagnosed. If autism is diagnosed first, often psychologists put everything down to this one specific condition, including a so-called lack of empathy, resulting in third party conditions being ignored and neurodivergent people not receiving the help they need. This is an important issue because if you send someone for talk therapy for what you've diagnosed as autism, when really it's socio or psychopathy, not only are they not receiving the correct treatment to help support them, you actually could be teaching someone with this condition how to further mask their condition and actually learn how to manipulate other people for further harm, if this is a potential risk with this specific individual. The tendency to focus on empathy as a sign of innate virtue is leading to real world harm, when in reality it's only one facet in the overall issue of what leads someone to become a terrorist or school shooter. Being autistic or any other neurodivergence doesn't work like we're characters in a fantasy story, a bomb constantly waiting to go off or for someone to switch the mass murder gene on. No human being is that simplistic. We are a messy formulation of dreams, drives and experiences. All being autistic does is sometimes perhaps make how we form those dreams, drives and experiences more complex. We can't deny how we become who we are reinforced by the environment that we grow up in. If there's one thing that becomes apparent in the research on autistic people who go on to do horrific things, it's not that the autism is the key component. It's the combination of nihilism and trauma with other extremist ideologies that are often much more enticing if you're operating from a state of loneliness and deep depression, often with a heavy dose of scapegoating, bigotry and entitlement mixed in for good measure. Being shunned and treated badly for being autistic can impact this, absolutely, but being autistic in and of itself is never the cause. We can see this most recently with the Plymouth shooter and the comments he was leaving on Reddit and cell forums and on YouTube. He mentioned his autism in relation to a financial dispute he had with his mother and difficulties with PIP, a benefit he was claiming because he was autistic and clearly needed help. He blamed his vile, dysfunctional, chaotic mother for his difficulties here, unsurprising given misogyny is the foundation of being an incel. But for me reading about this, I am struck by how his rage that should have been targeted at an unfair system failing autistic people became so twisted in his head that it became about his mother. His misogyny frequently appeared to stop him from being able to keep his anger at where it was deserved, because of the thing that seems to tie a lot of incels in their worldview. Expectation and entitlement towards individuals instead of systems. Expecting women to give up their own personal autonomy to validate the insecurity of men so they don't have to be lonely, instead of critiquing a society society in which loneliness and isolation is rife regardless of gender reeks of a very individualistic approach to looking at your problems, and leads to a very individualistic solution where innocent strangers are killed because you yourself feel powerless in the face of the systems that rule our lives. I also want to emphasise here that I am in no way suggesting neurodivergence doesn't matter when it comes to acts of violence like this, it does. 
But what I'm saying is, it does neurodivergent people a great disservice when we act like violence and bigotry is inherent to these conditions, when they aren't, particularly autism. Especially where mental health services are as overwhelmed as they are, and cuts to welfare and benefits are ongoing, which will impact disabled and neurodivergent people already struggling the hardest, on top of the stigma and violence they already face. This is a guy who's got a lot of experience of, uh, of business. You will love business. It is the British way. Good. While I'm not ignoring people's brain chemistry, I'm saying way more focus needs to be put on the societal reasons these men lash out and punish innocent bystanders. A lot of the autistic terrorist myths become reduced to this individualistic worldview, a worldview hinged on personal responsibility. Whether that's the shooter's victims who supposedly should have done more for the people who committed these acts, it all reads to me like people who have been let down by the world they live in and felt they had no other outlet for this pain than to attack random individuals. These actions are still hideous, and the people who engage in them should absolutely be made accountable and helped with rehabilitation. But you can't handle a problem if you don't accurately identify what the problem is. Acknowledging, as the famous poem goes, that these people aren't the sharks, but the very water we swim in, paints a much more accurate picture of the problem. This goes beyond a simple, lone terrorist bad person because dangerous condition or faulty genetics, especially since linking certain conditions or identities to undesirable traits and framing them as worthy of fear has proven to have dangerous outcomes for marginalised people again and again and again. The emphasis on personal responsibility also includes the overuse of terms like empath, abuser and narcissist. It's all an implication that these innate traits are not teachable skills. And it's unsurprising that the people most often painted as missing the trait we most clearly link to an innate humanity and capacity for goodness is often the people most marginalised and in need of support. The people painted as lacking human compassion are then some of the most dehumanised. The dehumanisation of autistic people via things like over fetishization of empathy, plus the demonisation of other neurodivergences like narcissistic personality disorder, has the potential to add up to a worldview that society would be safer if these neurodivergences didn't exist within it. Essentially, eugenics. This is particularly insidious when you consider autistic people are most often the victims of eugenicist violence and abuse themselves. Attempting to fit people in a good or bad dichotomy by surmising the entirety of a person by their best or worst actions contributes to a society where we ignore the good acts of people labelled bad and, more importantly, the bad acts of people labelled good. I'm an empath, right? This good-bad dichotomy also ignores that people don't kill because they don't know right from wrong. Everyone knows it's wrong to kill or hurt people, especially autistic people who have a strong sense of injustice and frequently over-police their own behaviour for fear of accidentally hurting someone or saying the wrong thing. When it comes to breaking down what leads someone to doing something like this, it shows a fundamental misunderstanding of people when we boil down violent behaviour essentially to bad and good. To quote my favourite show, It's not about right, not about wrong. It's about power. If we want to solve this problem, we need to call out myths like this when we see them. There are so many things that go into making the shooters and terrorists of the world. Pain that is not transformed, is transferred. Things like this aren't going to change until we can call the problem out properly. And the failures, I would say, of neoliberalism. And the mass media that continues to push and circulate titles like this are one of the biggest contributors to this problem. Autism is never the sole reason people commit bad acts or good ones, and one autistic person's actions aren't characteristic of the entire gamut of autistic people. We are just people, sometimes good, sometimes bad, and sometimes a combination of both. One would think neurotypical people, who claim to have superior powers of perception in personal interactions, would be able to see that more clearly than we do. Thank you so much for watching everyone, this video took a lot of work and I hope it's been helpful and I hope everyone is taking care and keeping safe and yep, yeah, see you in the next video, bye! Well, you were myth taken.